Happy Halloween. Uh, and welcome to our annual uh, Robert A. Mundell Global uh, Risk uh, Lecture, uh, now in its fifth edition. So we've been doing this for five years. The annual series gives us the opportunity to bring to Bologna top scholars and practitioners uh, working in the general area of risk. It's a distinguished, distinguished feature of our Master of Arts in Global Risk degree made possible by the generous support of our alumnus uh, Advisory Council Chairman and Johns Hopkins Trustee James Anderson. Uh, Bob Mundell uh, was a member of the Johns Hopkins SICE International Economics Faculty and taught at SICE Europe on and off between 1959 and 2001. Uh, much of his pioneering work in monetary dynamics and optimum currency areas, uh, which resulted in his Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Science in 1999, uh, was conducted during his time in Bologna. Before his passing, uh, he, Bob and his wife, Valerie, uh, came to just about every uh, Mundell Global Risk Lecture. And we are so happy, Valerie, that, uh, that uh, you could be here with Nicholas uh, once again uh, with us here today. And it really is wonderful that you can, you can make it. Uh, today, we host Ugo Panitza, uh, Professor of Economics and Pictet Chair in Finance, uh, Picte, how do you pronounce Picte? Okay, Chair in Finance uh, and Development at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, um, who'll talk about climate risk and sovereign debt. Before we begin, I'd like to mention a few things about Bob, Bob Mundell and his more than half century, century influence on economics. Uh, no student, certainly in this room, will graduate from SICE without having a solid understanding of his key contributions. In fact, that's been the case for SICE graduates for at least five decades. Uh, the same is true of any PhD students in economics. Indeed, one comment I'll give about Bob's work is that it is relevant at all levels of analysis. His seminal work features such depth that it can be conveyed intuitively, algebraically, by graphical analysis, or in uh, sophisticated models, as relevant for the principles of economics as for the most advanced courses in international finance. But Bob wasn't just an economic luminary, he was a wonderful person. The first time I personally met Bob was when he was in residence in fall 2000, right after his Nobel Prize. Uh, and I came to the, to the Bologna Center on sabbatical from Brandeis University uh, for one semester and, uh, and ended up being a very long semester. Um, while he had just gotten the, the Nobel, uh, Bob was extremely gracious with his time working with us younger faculty in formal and informal context. I gained a great deal from these discussions. Uh, Bob always shared with us his fresh and innovative approaches to monetary, financial, fiscal, and trade issues. Yes, Bob did some seminal work in trade uh, as well as in finance. I won't say that he worked inside the box or outside the box, but or that Bob created a box. Um, he didn't believe in boxes, uh, a testament to free innovative thinking. There's a great lesson for all of us in that, and we do miss him greatly. So now on today's talk, uh, Professor Tito Cordella uh, will be chairing the session. Um, he's the SICE Europe Vera and Stefano Zamagni Chair in Development Economics, uh, and uh, joined us uh, a short time ago, just a few months ago, um, even though he's no stranger to Bologna, frankly. Um, Prior to coming to Bologna, uh, he was at the World Bank and the IMF, and then before that, uh, he was an academic uh, in, uh, in Spain. Um, he's been uh, he, at the World Bank, he held various research and uh, operational capacities, including as a deputy chief economist for Latin America. So Tito, let me, let me turn it over to you. Okay, <clears throat> Mike, thank you a lot. Let me just say I'm glad I am to welcome Hugo at SAIS. And I really like to thank him for accepting uh, the invitation to deliver the Mandel Global Risk Memorial Lecture. Hugo, as Mike said, is the PHS Chair in Finance and Development and the Director of the International Center for Monetary and Banking Study at the Geneva Institute. And this is the center which publish every year the Geneva Report on the world economy, whose last uh, issue Hugo would uh, present today. Hugo is also the vice president of CPR. And last, last but not least, Hugo is a John Hopkins graduate, and this may well be uh, one of the root causes behind 
many of his accomplishments. But let me say that uh, I've known Hugo for, for a long time, maybe too long. We met when we both were young economists working in international financial institution in DC, probably late in the last century. And Hugo was throwing some of the best parties in town. <laughs> Let me not dig into this, can come out to be embarrassing, nothing to be ashamed of, just some, um, some embarrassing. And let me say that what I always admire in Hugo is his intellectual rigor and his, let me say, childish curiosity. And it's really this childish curiosity which allowed him to provide new answers to all problems and to make, look at this old problem in a completely new perspective. Hugo's curiosity, I think, is only match, matched by his intellectual rigor and his Calvinist work ethic. Well, he ended up in Geneva <laughs> after all. <laughs> I would also like to mention Hugo's generosity with time and his unique man mentoring ability. I do not think, and this really is a statistical fact, that any professor in any university in the world has more students placed in the IMF or the World Bank than Hugo. And this says a lot about not only how much he's good with his students, but it also says something about his own research that is always guided by relevant policy questions and this, I think, is the very reason why we invited Hugo to give this Mandel lecture. Let me just say, if you look at Hugo's publication, he published in many different areas. Many of you may know his work on debt from the original scene work with Ricardo Hausmann and Barry Eichengreen to his more recent work on debt restructuring and repudiation through his classical Jordan economic literature piece with uh, um, Federico Sturzenegger and Jerome Zettelmeyer. Hugo, but Hugo wrote paper in many different areas, and my favorite, if I can pick one, is his 2015 Journal of Economic Growth piece on too much finance. His 2007 less known paper, but on bank ownership and performance, in which show a new way of looking at countercyclical role of public bank. And I would also like to mention a paper on private public wage differentially, the differential that was original title why do lazy people make more money? And then it, the title was changed by the editor of the journal. <laughs> Hugo is also a terrific speaker. And without further ado, I leave him the floor to present his last Geneva report on climate risk and something like that. Hugo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gianluca. Uh, first of all, as, as they would say, uh, my father would be proud and my mother would even believe you. <laughs> um, so, 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 so thank you, Tito. Thanks, Mike. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a great honor. I have to say something about Pictet. So, uh, so Pictet is a family of bankers in Geneva. Um, but, you know, part of Geneva, Carouge, used to be part of the Regno di Sardegna. <laughs> and in fact, uh, uh, an ancestor of the Picte family is the founder of the Italian Guardia di Finanza. Wow. It was called the Re, Regia Polizia, non so che cosa, or the, in the Kingdom of Sardinia. Um, so so it's, it's, it's a great honor. It's a great honor to have a lecture associated to the name of Bob Mandel for anybody uh, who studies international co economy being associated to a true giant in the profession. Uh, it's an immense honor. Uh, it's even... Um, more of an honor to do it in my own country, in Italy, and at Hopkins, where, where I graduated. So this is, uh, this is really, really happy. And I was so happy to be able to, uh, to meet Valerie and, and Nicola. So this is, uh, so thank you. Um, I, I also, as, as Tito mentioned, I'm um, currently the director of the International Center for Monetary and Banking Studies, and, uh, and ICMB. Uh, was founded in 1973, so it's going to turn 50 next year by, by Alex Woboda, who was a very good friend of Bob, and, 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 and Bob Mandel was one of the founding fathers of ICMB. So this is, uh, uh, this is another association. So, and as Tito said, I'll be, uh, so ICMB does, does many things, but it produces once a year a Geneva report. Usually the director of the center does not contribute to, to the report, but this year I made an exception, so I'm one of the authors of the report, and I will be uh, talking about that. And, 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 the, and the topic of the report is that, what you see on the title is climate and debt. That's the report. So by, by the way, it's joined with Patrick Bolton, 
Libukait and me to Gulati, so Lee and, and me to our lawyers. So for once we mix with lawyer, this idea of interdisciplinarity. And then uh, Beatrice Vedder and, and Jeremy Zettelmeyer. So I was not at the, at the annual meeting of the IMF and World Bank uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, but my friends uh, who were there told me that there were two uh, key topics of conversation. Uh, the first one was inflation, and the second one was the link between that and, um, and climate. And so that's, that's what I will be talking about. And uh, I will go through my lecture, I will use uh, five numbers. In fact, as you see, normally I only use four numbers. I presented this report in Helsinki a few days ago. I only use four numbers, but here I will use five. Let me see why uh, the fifth one. So how do different people from different backgrounds and different professions think about this issue of climate and, and that? So we have these two crises, uh, you know, to cry, let, I spend a lot of time, but you know, we are aware about the climate change issue and, and, and several countries have very high level of debt and people have been associating these two things with different approaches. So you have the business people, the people in the financial sector and the, and the people in the financial sector is say, well, you know, let's just create some cool instrument and, and then the market will take care of it. So that's the approach of our friends in the financial sector. Then you have the civil society people, the people in the NGO. And so these are the, the people in the NGOs. And, um, and they, you know, these guys are most well, just give that relief, big time transfers, tough regulation, and, uh, and, and this will be the solution to the problem. And then there is the, the, the approach of the card carrying economist, so I didn't have a good picture for card carrying economy. So I put a can opener because of the typical joke about, you know, let's assume to have a can opener. And, uh, and you know, this is like, it's simple, just tax carbon and that will solve the problem. So, so you, you need to be an Italian of my generation to understand this one, but I'll, I will get to this later. So let me go over the outline of the report. I will say something about climate perspective, something about debt and fiscal space. Then I will discuss financing by focusing on three things, green bonds, the carbon credit market, and debt relief. So you see these are uh, a little, the carbon credit market is a little bit the economies, car carrying economies linked to carbon taxation. Green bonds is the financiers and debt relief is the civil society NGO crowd. And then I will discuss what we think is a set of necessary policies uh, for addressing these issues. But Tito will tell you, tell me when I have 10 minutes. Okay. So let me start with the climate perspective. And here again, we can split this on, 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 on different viewpoints. And uh, the first point, uh, point is what we call the planetary view. And it has to do with emission and the need to mitigate this emission. So, you remember I told you I'm gonna give some number. It works well in Italian, that in numeri. Uh, I'm gonna give you some numbers. So let's start with the first number, which is 300. Why 300? Now, if you listen to the scientists, if you listen to the uh, internet governmental plan, the intergovernmental panel of climate change, uh, which have you know some science-based prediction uh, of how much CO2 we can still put in the atmosphere to limit climate change to a certain amount. If we want to achieve with high probability the 1.5 degree limit, that is to increase uh, global temperature by at most 1.5 degrees with respect to pre-industrial time, we have 300 gigatons left. So we cannot put more than 300 gigaton uh, in the atmosphere, if we want to achieve this objective, with high probability. Notice that this is a stock; it's not an annual flow, because carbon, once it's in the atmosphere, it stays there for a very, very long time. That's how much we can put. So that's my first number, three hundred. Let me go to the second number. How much are we putting in the atmosphere right now? And we're putting about forty gigatons. 
So we have a remaining budget of 300, we're putting 40. Now, if you do 300 divided by 40, you get eight point something. So that's at current emission level, our budget will be over in eight years. And that's it. Now, who is putting this carbon in the atmosphere? So this is a map in which countries are scaled the size of the country is scaled according to how much carbon they're putting in the atmosphere in a given year. And, and two things that you see here, well, two things that you don't see, you don't see Africa, you see a little bit of sub, you know, South Africa, but basically Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa is missing from the map. Uh, Latin America is very small. The US is about to scale. So the, the US puts a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, but the US is a relatively, uh, uh, not densely populated country. And then Europe is huge. You see, even Italy is very large. And, you know, the Germany is very large. The UK is very large. The, the Middle East is very large. China is huge. So these are the people who are putting uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. Like the planet doesn't really care who puts the CO2 in the atmosphere. It's just the total amount. But people kind of care, right? So first thing, so... Uh, some countries are not putting much climate, much uh, carbon out. Why, there, why is Sub-Saharan Africa not putting much carbon in the atmosphere? Well, simply because Sub-Saharan Africa is, is poor. So there is, a, I'll show you a graph later, there is a very high correlation between how much carbon per capita we put in the atmosphere and income per capita. This, this makes sense. Now, clearly, uh, we want to reduce carbon emission, but ideally we don't want to keep poor country poor. So we, we would like this country which are currently poor and they're not emitting because are poor, we would like them to become rich. Like China in a sense is be, became rich, but these countries cannot, if we want to limit carbon emission, this country cannot grow like China. So this is the line up there is China. China was a growth miracle, but it grew by multiplying by 10 the CO2 that has been putting in the atmosphere. And now China is the largest issuer in the world, larger than the US. Of course, it also has a much larger population. So in per capita term, it emits less than the US, but in total it emits less. So, so that's the, the, the planetary perspective. And, and this has to do, we, we'll have to deal with this through what is called mitigation. We'll have to be, put less carbon in the atmosphere. But climate change is happening. You know, the 1.5 degree uh, limit will be breached with almost for sure. And even if it's not breached, uh, we are already observing climate change. And, and this has effect on countries which will have to spend money in adaptation, in adapting to higher global temperature. And uh, so this is a map, again, of the world in which the darker color uh, tells you which countries are more... Uh, at risk from climate change. But let me use another map, which is kind of cooler, which is like the one before in which I put, I scale country size by the risk. Now you see Africa. Africa, it's really big, right? So now it's, uh, so you see that, so this is uh, who contributes to the problem and who suffers from the problem. So. Uh, there is, there is, there is, there is a, a big imbalance here, and and the issue in the, how how we deal with this. Um, so, so even if we reach the, you know, if we're able to reach the one point five degrees uh, threshold, which we're probably going to breach, uh, money will need to be spent in 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 certain countries. <clears throat> And how are we gonna finance that? That's a big question, I'll get back to this later. Uh, there is an issue of biodiversity, but let me skip this for a moment. Now, when you think about biodiversity and how it's emitting, uh, you know, there are massive uh, carbon sinks in poorer parts of the world. Some of these carbon sinks are actually things that are absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. You can think about the, the Amazon forest. But there are also a lot of carbon in the ground in many countries in the, in the form of oil or other things, uh, which these countries could use to become richer. And 
you know, if this guy is in Nigeria is told, look, you should not pump your oil because by pumping your oil, you're gonna make the, the climate situation worse. The Nigerians are gonna tell him, hey, you became rich by pumping oil. You became rich by putting uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. Why shouldn't I do it? Um, so, 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 so there is an issue here and I'll get back to it later. But um, before uh, going there, let me try to make a thought experiment. Let, let, let's assume that you are the emperor of the galaxy and somehow you can create, you have control of this budget. You say, okay, I'm gonna uh, limit emission to these 300 gigatons. So I'm gonna achieve the 1.5%, 1.5 degrees target. And, and what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna have this, uh, 300 gigatons, I'm gonna allocate them across the world. And then we are economists and we know that, you know, you allocate and then you let people trade and you're gonna uh, reach some Pareto optimal situation. But of course the fairness of this Pareto optimal depends on the initial allocation. And so the big question is like, how do I do the initial allocation? And basically, if you read carefully the Paris Agreement, the initial allocation is like, people are putting a lot of carbon in the atmosphere now they have right to issue more. It kind of seems wrong, right? From a fairness point of view. So what are the alternatives? And we don't have an answer yet, so it's more that just to think about. Maybe one alternative is to allocate uh, the same amount of emission uh, to each person. So each person in the planet will have a given amount of emission and then you let them trade. And so you would have richer people maybe will buy right to emit from poorer people, but there will be a transfer in this. People may say, well, this is not really right because you have the rich people already put a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. Maybe they should have, they should be discounted from their budget. Maybe some country, in some countries, it's easier to avoid emission. In other countries, it's more difficult. Um, some countries are more vulnerable, others are less vulnerable. Uh, so, so there is an issue uh, of, even if you were the emperor of the universe and you could limit this, there is a fairness issue how you allocate uh, this initial budget and for which we, we don't have a clear answer. Well, this is basically who put the existing amount of carbon that we have in the atmosphere. The blue and grayish lines are the advanced economies, the red are the lower one are the emerging economies, the red one being China, so China plays a big role but most of the CO2 in the atmosphere has been actually put by, by the rich countries. There is a big, as I said before, uh, richer countries. So this is this graph, they just show the correlation between GDP per capita and the emission per capita. And you do see that richer country put much more CO2 than poorer country, as you would expect. Now, the positive things that even within rich countries, there are large differences. So something can be done. I'm gonna show you two countries, the last two countries where I lived, well, the country where I'm living now, which is Switzerland, and the country where I lived before, which is the US. They are here. They have similar standard of living, but massive difference in emission per capita. So something can be done. Uh, so now let me go to financing. So th th there are around all sorts of estimates about the cost. So first of all, we have two types of cost. One cost is the cost of mitigation. That is putting less CO2 in the atmosphere. This is mostly a cost that has to be borne by the rich economies, which are the ones that are putting a lot of CO2. And this is a cost that actually can, a lot of it can go through private sector financing because actually they're, you know, uh, private sector firms are putting the CO2. So you could regulate them, tax them, whatever. But then there is the cost for adaptation, that is the cost of surviving with higher global temperature. And this is a cost, if you remember this big map of Africa, this is a cost that is uh, mostly, mostly falls on the shoulders of um, poorer countries. And this is a cost that mostly has to be absorbed by the public sector, because these are basically public goods that needs to be produced, dams, all this sort of stuff. And, and you know, and there are, bunch of estimations around how much this will cost, you know, yeah, they range. So this is kind of actually a, a low estimation, $500 billion per year. And then you have estimation in trillions, but anyway, whatever number 
it seems to be big number or not. 500 billion per year is a massive number, but then, you know, it's less than 0.5% of the GDP of the richer economy. So it's a very large number in absolute values, not a massive number uh, relatively to the world GDP. So anyway, so we need money to finance adoption. Many countries, and this is the link with debt, many countries, they already have, they're already at high risk of debt distress, especially the poorest countries. So this graph uh, shows um, the, the classification of countries into four groups, country at low risk of debt distress, this is the green, moderate, this is the yellow, high risk of debt distress, this is the red, and in debt distress, this is the, bar, the black bar. And as you can see, the share of countries which are either in that distress, the red part, or uh, sorry, either in that distress, the black part, or at high risk of that distress, uh, the red part has been increasing. And now about 60% of low income countries are at high risk of that distress. And these are the countries which need uh, to allocate public expenditure to deal with climate change adaptation. By the way, this is my fourth number is 60%. And the, and the issue is like how we're going to finance, uh, how are these countries going to finance uh, the, the needed expenditure adaptation? Uh, let me skip this. Given that, uh, number one, these countries are already at high risk of that distress. We do some econometric analysis in the report, which shows that these countries tend to be, uh, the, 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 the fiscal position of this country um, is much more sensitive to climate shocks than those of the advanced economies. So climate change will make the situation worse from a fiscal point of view. Uh, we know that uh, in general borrowing costs in emerging and developing countries, uh, when they borrow from the private sector, many low income countries actually borrow from the official sector. So this is less of a problem, uh, are much more volatile and they respond much more to, to global shocks. So that's, that's another problem. And, and also we chose in the, so actually Uli Volz has a series of paper of this, which we uh, corroborate in the report. Um, uh, we show that uh, borrowing costs of emerging and developing countries are very susceptible to climate risk, which is in line with point three uh, that tells you that uh, climate shocks have a very large impact on, on, on the fiscal sustainability in, in, in developing economies. Uh, so taking all these facts together, uh, it's plausible that many, many emerging and developing economies might not be able, might not have the fiscal resources uh, to, to finance uh, adaptation to climate change. So what, so at this point, uh, Lenin would say what is to be done. So what, <laughs> what, uh, what can be done? done? And, and here there are these three, three proposals, uh, these three ideas. So again, if you talk with people in the financial sector, they say, well, we have all this green finance initiative. And here, since we're focusing on uh, the public sector, we uh, looked a little bit at the state of the market for green sovereign bonds. So these are bonds issued by sovereign entities or by the government of government owned uh, corporations, which have some promise to use the funds uh, to, uh, for activities that either uh, mitigate or adapt to climate change. Uh, and, 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 uh, and we came out a little bit skeptical from this. Uh, so, so let me, first of all, these green bonds are very small, mostly new. So in Europe, the green sovereign bonds. So here the, 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 the greens, the green bars are actually bonds issued by the true sovereign, so that by the Italian government, by the German government. The, um, the orange one are issued by local governments. So you see in the US, there is nothing issued, sorry, the blue one are the one issued by the government. Uh, in, in the US, it's only basically a local government uh, that issued this stuff. The green one are 
bonds which are issued by sovereign backed uh, entities like KFW in Germany or would be the Casa Depositi and Prestiti in Italy. I don't think Casa Depositi and Prestiti issue this stuff, but whatever. And, um, and, the, and the, the blue one I told you, okay. So first of all, the, the, the first thing is that there are, most of this thing happens in, in, in Europe, about 80 billion issuance per year, but this is still very small. Uh, much smaller in the US, 4 billion, so 20 times smaller. Uh, there is a little bit in other advanced economies outside Europe, <clears throat> and um, kind of very little in emerging markets. And there is some issuance by international organizations. So in fact, here the the so it's interesting when we look at these bonds. The former employer of Tito, the World Bank, has a lot of these bonds, but they're all very small. And then the the real big player player here is the European Investment Banks, which has a smaller number of bonds, but they're big. Uh, so this is mostly EIB stuff. Now, why, why would countries issue these bonds in which they promise to do something green? Uh, well, the idea is that there is what is called the greenium. I'm issuing these green bonds and I'm going to pay a lower interest rate. So we tried to look at this greenium and we didn't find it. <laughs> so that's, you know. and when you find it, it's very, very small. The only thing that was interesting that we found it, so, so this is a graph that shows on the vertical axis, the greenium, uh, and, uh, and on the horizontal axis, the exposure to climate risk. It seems to be that countries which are more at risk from, from climate change tend to uh, enjoy a higher greenium, but this is really, really preliminary. So I don't wanna put too much emphasis on this. Now, the interesting thing, and this is the great thing when you work with lawyers, that lawyers read contracts. And, and, and this is a typical contract from a green sovereign bond. But they're all kind of like this. And, and look at this. What well, is the intention of the issuer to use the money to do some green stuff? There is no legal obligation to do that. And, you know, we'll try to do it. But, you know, we're not forced to do it. And plus, there is no legal obligation that this stuff will have any effect on what we care about. And all these things are written like this. So this is the Hungarian bond, but they're pretty much all written like this. And this makes sense. It makes sense because, you know, in a sense, you cannot, at, at the end, uh, the, the entity that decides the allocation of public expenditure is the parliament. And it's very hard to have a contract that binds the parliament to do this. And of course, even, so this is the, the lawyer approach. And of course, when you're an economist, you say, I don't care, even it binds it, you know, money is fungible and, you know, who cares? Uh, the other thing that we look at it, and this is what, you know, what the economist likes is the creation of a market. And, 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 so, and, uh, and, and, and so, so what we thought that, you know, if we could, go back to our all, my old experiment, kind of cap emission and then let people trade. Then you would have a real market. It would be really large. It will have a lot of value, but this needs to be compulsory. Now we have all this carbon credit market, which are voluntary and they're pretty much nonsense. Let me tell you about the tickets that I bought to come to Bologna. So I go to the website of Lufthansa and I bought, buy my ticket. And the ticket is like 300 euros. And then it says, do you want to offset your flight? It's like, yeah, I want to offset my flight. And it said, okay, offset number one, five euros. Like, yeah, cool. And then it says, this doesn't really offset much. It's like more serious offset, offset 150 euros. This offset about 50% of your flight. And then you really want to offset it 400 euros, which is more than the price of the ticket. Now, who is going to buy I mean, if I, if I come to Mike and say, look, I bought this ticket, it was 300 euros, and then I put on it other 400 for offset. <laughs> you see? <laughs> so, of course, if this were compulsory, you know, the ticket would simply be more expensive, and that's it. Uh, but it cannot be uh, voluntary. But now, if this is compulsory, then, then this creates really, could create really a huge market. 
uh, all these countries which we didn't see in this map, which have all this natural carbon sink, then they would have an asset to sell. And, and, and this asset would be, uh, would be valuable. It would have a market value. So this will not longer be a grant, a transfer, but to say you, are, you can pump your oil or sell the offset. Uh, so we, we think that this is uh, something which has potential. This is just something to show you the difference in the quality of carbon offset. The, the high bar is the price of a ton of carbon in the European market, which is compulsory. And the other one are the price of a ton of carbon in all these voluntary markets. So it's clearly there is, if prices uh, signal some form of quality or scarcity, uh, there is really a huge uh, bias there. Now, let me go to uh, our friends in the NGOs. Is there a case uh, for debt relief for climate? And, and here, we are a bit skeptical. <clears throat> so if we go back to another great economist, to Jan Timbergen, you know, he taught us that we have goals and we have instruments. And, uh, and we, when you think in this term, you find that debt for climate swaps are rarely optimal. They're rarely optimal for two reasons. Uh, one reason has to do that, um, it's true that you have uh, these countries which are at high risk of climate and some countries that need to provide services, but these two things are not always aligned, but they're aligned in many cases. But, but the problem, if you uh, do an analysis of the incentives and we go to some great detail in the report and you can go back to this if you want, uh, you will see that the, the, if your goal is just to uh, provide room for climate change, grants are the way to go. If the goal is to reduce that, restructuring is the way to go. So in, there are a few cases in which these two objectives are aligned. And you know, when it's the case, that's fantastic, but they're not often. Of course, sometimes uh, politics might make this debt for nature swap the only politically viable alternative, so you do it. What we, what we propose in the report, what we think uh, it would be good, and the IMF is moving in that direction, is to have some form of climate conditionality when countries uh, have to restructure their debt. So in the typical case, when a, when, a case, when a country cannot pay its debt, it goes to the IMF, it deals with its creditors, the IMF does a debt sustainability analysis, they say, okay, your debt was 100, you can only pay 50, so let's cut the debt to 50, you know, there is a negotiation and you get into debt. And, and what we're saying, say, when we decide whether it's 50, 40 or 22, we should uh, be careful in including uh, the, the fiscal cost of climate change, which might increase this haircut, this cut in debt that the country get. But then the country should commit to spend the money for mitigation, because if you give them a higher haircut and then they spend the money to do something else, well, you'll have another debt crisis down there. We discussed that this could be done with another type of financial instrument that we see as being better than, than green bonds. I'm almost done, Tito. That, 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 um, that we see as a better instrument than green bonds, because how do green bonds work? The typical green bond works this way. I'm gonna borrow $50 million and I use, I'm gonna use this $50 million to do something. And I have the details on what I'm going to do. I'm going to put solar plant panels. I'm going to put wind turbines. I'm going to do something else. Uh, so, so there are there are there are two issues here. The issue that I already, well, I already told you about these issues. One that it's these are these promises are often non credible. That money is 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 fungible, but also that might be these things that will is there are not the best way to deal with climate change. So having a, a bond what are called a sustainability link bonds in which I don't specify what I'm gonna do, but I'm gonna specify an objective. So I could write a bond, it says, this bond commits this country to reduce carbon emission by X gigatons. And then if I do this, I get a discount in my coupons. And if I don't, I don't get a discount in my coupon. So we see this type of instrument as being uh, 
much more incentive compatible. And we could think that in a typical debt restructuring, uh, uh, the countries could commit to this climate objective through this type of sustainability linked bonds, which would have a positive market creation externalities because that might be once the market for this type of bonds is created, uh, other countries might, uh, which don't need to restructure it, that might start issuing this type of debt instruments. So this is another thing that we discussed. So let me uh, go to almost my slide slides. So we discuss at the end, uh, we discuss six types of policies, which I already mentioned, but let me summarize them. So the first one is this issue of creating a mandatory market for carbon offset. And here the key word is mandatory. The second one, which I just mentioned, is this idea of including climate conditionality in, uh, in that restructuring. Uh, the third thing, if we want to have a well-working uh, market for sustainability-linked uh, uh, bonds, uh, we need to have a, some monitoring mechanism that needs to be set up, which is credible. Um, then the fourth point is the Jerry Maguire point. You remember Jerry Maguire, the movie, Show Me the Money? <laughs> So, so this is, you know, they have to be there. There needs to be fiscal transfer. This needs to be part of the picture. Uh, our lawyers uh, created a sort of, uh, uh, a sort of framework in which you could write a bond contract in which create some commitment. And the, and the sixth policy is to uh, improve the design of debt for nature swaps that so far have been very small and not uh, really effective. So this is this was my fourth number. This is six six policies. So what I there is one more number, and this is very specific to here because, of course, you cannot uh, give a lecture name after Robert Mondel without putting a triangle. Right, so we, we among the many things that that, that Mike, Michael mentioned is the the, the famous uh, Mandelian impossible trinity, right? That you can have only two of three of between having free capital flows, a fixed exchange rate, <clears throat> and an independent monetary policy. And, and when you think about the issues that I mentioned here, you think there is another triangle. So when you think about these issues, you would like a set of solutions which are which are scalable. So, you know, this is a big problem. We need to, all these things that does a little bit at the margin. It's okay, something is better than nothing, but, but you need to have, you know, we're talking with the first order effects here. We need something with, which is politically feasible because it can come up with all the perfect solution, but then at the end, you know, uh, you, you see when in, when in France, Macron tried to in, put, the equivalent of a carbon tax, it got the gilets jaunes. In Switzerland, we had a referendum a couple of years ago in increasing the carbon tax and people voted against it. Uh, so, so that's important. And, and the third element, so, oh, the third element, I cannot see it, but on, on the top up there, it says fair, <laughs> but you cannot see it. And, and that's the, this issue of fairness, which is on two levels, one level is across country and the other level is intergenerational. That's another uh, important issue. I, I hope it will not be an impossible trinity <laughs> like the Mandelian trinity, but, uh, but that's where we would like it. So let me just, my last slide, uh, you remember when I showed you the picture of, uh, you know, the, the, the the financial people, the NGOs, and the economists that put down uh, an image. I don't know if any of you recognize that, that, that guy there. This guy. Yeah, should not have done this. But. <laughs> what was there? 
I don't know if anybody recognized that guy there. So there, 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 there was a commercial when, when Tito and I were kids. It was a commercial about coffee machine, the mocha coffee machine. That guy is the Omino Bialetti, which had, now I'm gonna go back there. And the, the commercial was, sembra uh, facile. It looks easy. <laughs> But it's also very important. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to do something. So I'll quit here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Hugo. Let, okay, let me take advantage of my pleasure to just pose one question and then open to everybody else in the floor. And my question is the following one. When you look at, especially both on the adaptation and the mitigation issue, if you look at adaptation, you say the cost would be on the order of 0.5% of GDP of the richest country. So countries, there is sort of obligation, the Domo's community, we know the 0.7 threshold, the idea that every country should contribute in this way. So my question is that given the current framework, to which extent the effort for fighting climate change, both on the mitigation, the effect and the adaptation side, are will substitute for other project or would be complementary? What are the trade-offs that one can assess between the need to monitor climate change and the ones the one that are needed for poverty alleviation? The link to this question, my question is that you think, my own view is there is sort of a, I would rather have a new, fully dedicated international financial organization dealing with climate change rather than having the World Bank or the IMF meddling their mandate, this is one. What are your views this, in this respect? Okay. Let me start by uh, noting something that at one of the various COP, I forgot which one, mm -hmm. the rich economies uh, promised 10 billion a year, which is one fifth yeah. of this estimate. And they never delivered on the 10 billion. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, so, so, th so that's the first thing to note, right? That, that, that there is no, uh, there is, so, so be before discussing whether there is a trade-off or not, uh, there seem, you know, very few countries are achieving this 0.7% objective, which we never understood from where it came out, but <laughs> so at some point somebody came out of like 0.7% or whatever. Um, there is a trade-off, there isn't a trade-off. Um, Maybe there is not a trade-off. Maybe you, you could think you could have uh, this sort of uh, type of green investment, which also contributes to, to, to poverty reduction. So really, this is really uh, in the details, but that's my impression. But, you know, I have no clue, you know, I, I really have no clue about boots on the ground stuff. So, but, but that's my impression. I, I, I don't see this as a, as, as a trade-off. You could think that you could have, uh, you know, uh, mitigation expenditure and whatever that actually uh, benefits the poor, which in general probably they're the one who are going to suffer the most, who suffer the most from uh, from climate change. Uh, the idea of having uh, a new and independent institution specifically tasked with this, I think it's a, I think it's a good idea. Uh, now. <laughs> Is it politically feasible? <laughs> I mean, the, I, I, I guess the reason why uh, most of this thing is going through, uh, you know, to the World Bank and, and the other multilateral is that this institution exists, they have some expertise. And, and uh, so in, in, in the current climate, I see it at, uh, very unlikely uh, that we're going to create a new institution. Uh, which uh, resources is last, large enough uh, to adopt this taste. So, uh, yeah. Okay, please. So, uh, Sergey. Here on the mic. So we don't have mics. Okay, Sergey, just shout. <laughs> Thanks so much. 
Oh, like this? Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Um, I, I'm not an economist, I'm a historian, and I'm, you know, uh, Mike always tries to uh, train me in economics by making economic references to go straight over my head. Uh, but, you know, the more I, the more I am at size, I think the more I would about economic concept it, to, it's important. Um, I, I wonder if I could ask stupid questions. You know, for 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 a non-economist, this will be, of course, you know, uh, or as an economist, it will be, uh, 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 you know, it will seem too too simple, I suppose. But I, as I said, You want to answer? Yeah, more. as you want. If you take another one, uh, Claudio. Okay. okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for your lecture. Very interesting. I wanted to ask you a question about um, like the creation of a market. So, like they say, the economist perspective and fairness. And I want to use your example uh, about like the the plane because. Uh, uh, I'm from Sardinia, I take a lot of planes, so it's something I relate a lot. Um, my question is, if we think about like internalizing this cost through prices, the point is that who, who, who actually pays this? Like if we look, look from a, an internal perspective, we have consumers and we have other economic actors. So my question is, are consumers who in the end pay such costs? And how does this relate with the question of fairness? Thank you. Why don't you, any other? Okay, why don't you answer this one and then we have another round. Okay, so about the, the mechanic of green bonds, um, anybody, I mean, my, my guess, the, 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 the biggest buyers of these green bonds <coughs> are, um, are, um, are, are basically funds. So you, you can go, uh, you know, if you have an app where you can buy financial assets, you're gonna find uh, exchange traded funds ETS, which has ESG compliant and this ETF will be, uh, will have uh, a lot of these green bonds uh, issued bought by the sovereigns and by the private sector. But I'm pretty sure I never tried to do it, but I'm pretty sure you can go again, if you have an app in which you can buy financial assets, you can buy directly the, the green bonds, but I guess where a lot of this uh, stuff sits, it sits in this uh, in these funds managed by the big uh, asset management company like uh, you know BlackRock and, and this sort of stuff. So so that's, that's where they sit. So they're not government to government normally. Ah, okay, okay. That, that that's that, that's the that's the big question, right? So. Uh, there isn't much of an incentive and that's why you don't see a greenium, right? So ideally you would like to think that, uh, you know, people which have a, so you, you may think that there are some agency which have a social mandate. And so this agency will buy uh, this green bond. So you as a individual investor, uh, you might think I wanna keep my savings into, into green assets. Now, the, the problem is, is the following that might be, and that seems that you're willing to, okay, if, if conventional bonds pay 5%, maybe you're willing to get 4.85% uh, from a green bonds and you feel good about it. But you know, nobody, so far we haven't seen anybody say if, if, if a conventional bonds pay 5%, I'm gonna get a comparable bond with the same risk, with the same characteristics nobody's willing to take a green bond that pays 4%. So that's, so that's a big issue. So not nobody, uh, and, and, and I think this is a little bit of the issue of this sort of green private sector things. And, you know, if people are not really forced to, to do this and some, some people will do it, but, you know, I see people, I see that's being 
very unlikely that people will take uh, large cuts or, or returns. Now there are some assets, so it is like a, a, a big discussion in green finance, whether you can do well by doing good, uh, but uh, you know, uh, yeah, but, 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 but that's a big issue. L let me put a hat on this. I'm sure you have been reading. There is this massive backlash in the US. So, so Texas has implemented anti-ESG law. Uh, Louisiana has been divesting its pension fund, its you know, Louisiana Public Sector Work Pension Fund from BlackRock. Not because BlackRock forces Louisiana to buy ESG compliant you know, funds, but only because Louisiana sells ESG compliant bonds. And these guys say, you know, we are a, a state that produces a lot of oil. And we think that you, by buying this thing, you are hurting us. And so we are not buying your assets anymore. So, so, uh, so that's, that's uh, yeah, that's, that's indeed an issue. So the, the second question, who pays for this? Well, th that's an incredibly complicated question because, um, well, first of all, you know that when you tax something, uh, the people who pays the cost of this something, uh, so that the incidence of a tax depends on the elasticity of demand and the elasticity of supply. So, so each type of tax uh, is, gonna, is going to have um, uh, a, a final uh, person who's gonna pay the cost. But then, you know, at, at the end, if you want to reduce uh, the use of carbon intensive uh, goods, it has to be the case that you, uh, you need to increase the price of these goods. <laughs> and then who, who bears the cost of this increased price of the goods? Again, it depends. I mean, I mean is, is this gonna be uh, reduced the, the profits of the producer? Is this gonna go in the shoulder of the consumer? Again, this really depends uh, on the on the on the elasticity of demand and supply. But you but you raised an important point, which we discuss a little bit in the report, which is linked to fairness. So you you could think that, that there are people for which uh, reducing emission is much more difficult than for other people. So as you said, I live in Sardinia. If I want to link to the continent, it's very hard to do this. You know, you know, I, I can come from 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 you know Milan to Bologna by train in one hour and don't emit a lot. But if I want to come from Sassari, you know, to Bologna, unless it's going to take me one day and a half with the with the ferry, I, I need to fly. And 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 this creates so 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 for you, cutting emission it's harder than for somebody who lives in Milan, simply because. And, and, and this issue, and, and you can think the same thing when you think at the planetary level, for a country level, there are certain kinds. So if, you're, if you live in a country where it's really, really hot, you know, spending money in air conditioning, uh, you know, in Geneva, air conditioning is illegal. So you need actually a, a special permission to, to put air conditioning in your house. And it's fine. It's really hot, like three weeks a year. But living in DC without air conditioning <laughs> is much more complicated. And living in Louisiana without air conditioning, it, it's even more complicated. And, and the same thing with heating, right? So if you live in Napoli, you can probably live okay without having a heating system in your house. If you live in Helsinki, that's uh, much more difficult, right? So again, different uh, people and different countries have different costs related to mitigating and adapting to climate change. And again, in a perfect world, you want uh, to have the price that sets the right incentive and then some redistribution, which compensate for this, but it's difficult, right? Other questions? Let me take one from, uh, let me take one from the, from the cyber world, cyberspace and then back, from Paolo Zangheri. UN suggested some form of debt relief for Pakistan due to floods. Are emerging market bonds getting closer to cat bonds? 
<laughs> so 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 maybe let me uh, put some some background on on what cat bonds are. Mm -hmm. So so uh, cat bonds or catastrophe bonds are bonds um, which have contingencies built in, which basically say if uh, so these are emitted sometimes by Caribbean island. Let's say if a hurricane of a certain power hits my country, or if an earthquake of a certain magnitude hits my country, I'm going to automatically reduce the payment on this bond. So this is category of, of, of contingent bonds. And the question is here uh, whether uh, emerging market bonds are becoming a catastrophe bond, at least implicitly. So, 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 so that's a difficult one. So, so the typical bond issued by an emerging market or issued by Italy is a bond which has a non-contingent promise to pay, right? I'm gonna say, you give me a hundred million and I'm gonna pay back to you hundred million plus interest at a certain point in time. So there is no contingency. I have a debt, I have to pay it. Implicitly, there is always a contingency because if, if something really bad happens to me, and I'm not going to be able to pay, um, you know, I'm going to pay less. And we've seen this with the haircuts, you know, we've seen this in, in many countries. Um, so it has been the case in the past and will be the case in the future that if a country is hit by a very large shock, be it a natural disaster, be it a, an economic disaster, the case of Argentina in 2001 was not a natural disaster. It's another thing. In the case of Greece, it was not a natural disaster. Uh, that at the end is always ex post contingent. Um, the big difference, <clears throat> and, and there is a very nice paper in the economic literature for, for, for that nerd, is a, a very nice paper by Herschel Grossman and John Van Huyck, which says that all debt contracts are implicitly contingent debt contracts. Um, but the problem is that emerging market bonds might become exposed akin to cat bond, catastrophe bonds. But the fact that this is not written in the contracts leads uh, to very large debt weight losses in terms of negotiation, in terms of verifiability and so on and so forth. So in my view, they're not. And... Uh, but it would be desirable if you were to see more cat bonds, more contingent debt in the world. Just, uh, just uh, wanted to ask for clarification. I thought uh, the discussion of climate conditionality was interesting, but I'm wondering if it uh, isn't kind of conceptually a bit problematic because I could see climate conditionality in the case of India, but most, countries that have these issues uh, would be like, say, in Africa, and they don't pollute. So if you got climate conditionality, you'd have no effect. So I'm wondering what exactly goes into that? Or is, you know, we wouldn't want to have something that would be like greenwashing or bringing in this uh, fairness issue. So, so actually, this is very good. So and, and I realized what I was presenting that I was not super clear here. And, uh, and again, uh, you can think of two types of expenditure. In fact, three types. So one type is uh, expenditure for mitigation. And as you said, most low-income countries don't emit. So what's the deal here? One type of expenditure is expenditure for adaptation. And, and, this, and I get back to this in a moment. And the third kind of expenditure is expenditure uh, of, you want my, what I want to call it for transformation or leapfrogging. So how you become rich without becoming rich like China. But, but let, let, let's, let's focus on adaptation for a moment. Let's suppose that, um, so my, my friend quarters, lawyer quarters, they don't want to make names of countries. So they always use the example of the mythical country of Ruritania. So there is Ruritania, which is a poor country uh, which uh, needs to restructure its debt. And uh, old IMF does, you know, it's that sustainability analysis. And it says, uh, you know, 
the, the sustainable level of debt is 60% of the existing level of debt. So we need a 40% haircut on the, on the initial level of debt. And then somebody says, no, 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 no. You have to realize that this country is gonna hit by all these sort of uh, events which are related to climate change. So it will have to spend money to build dams. It will have to spend money to fortify the ocean shores and all this sort of stuff. Because if the country doesn't do this, you're gonna have a big natural disaster which is gonna wipe out the economy. And you know, in five years, the debt will not be sustainable again. And in order to finance this expenditure, uh, you need to allocate money, which makes the sustainable level of debt not 60% of the current level of debt, but you know, 50%. So you need a 10% uh, haircut on top of what you would have calculated without this expenditure and mitigation. That's fine. So the country gets 50% haircut. Now, what you want to make sure now that this extra 10%, it's indeed spent in building dams, you know, in fortifying this thing, because if not, the, that, you know, the big event comes and, you know, you gave the country a bigger haircut and, you know, and after five years, you're again restart. So in, in the, this, it is the, the adaptation, but you're right. I was kind of com confused between that. Just, just a second. I have a question from uh, Chris Stampius saying, as I understood, the EU is implementing new rules for green bonds that can only be issued as green if they comply with their EU green taxonomy, including post issuance in evaluation of climate impact. Do you think this could solve problems or is there still not enough incentive to invest in these bonds without a greenium? And I add one on my, why should we expect, uh, it shouldn't the greenium only be negative if the marginal buyer is somebody that cares about the environment? Uh, can you repeat the question? No, this is my question. We okay. ask, we discuss later. So just ask her the one by. Okay, I, I don't know if the EU tax, so the EU taxonomy, first of all, uh, so it's a very important thing, but um, in, 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 in my talk, I was focusing on sovereign issuers, while the EU taxonomy is uh, mostly targeted to the private sector. So private, so it's slightly different, but it's still a very important question. So will it address the greenium? I don't know. One thing that it should address is the greenwashing problem. Whether it will address the greenium, it depends on uh, why we don't observe a greenium. And there are at least three possible reasons why we don't observe a greenium. And let me list uh, them. One possibility is that simply people don't care enough in the sense, you know, okay, I care about the environment, but I'm not willing to put real money from it. So if that's the case, the taxonomy is not gonna solve it. Another possibility is that, you know, I, I care about the environment, I would be willing to put some money, but I don't trust you because, you know, yeah. if this is the case, this might solve it. There could be uh, a third reason why I don't observe a greenium. And again, this the taxonomy will not solve it. Let's suppose that the reason <clears throat> why I'm willing, let, let's suppose that green investment is actually good for a firm. It's good for a firm because, you know, it reduces the stranded assets. So it increases profits in the long run. But if that's the case, and there is a paper in the Journal of Financial Economics by, um, I forgot her first name, last name is Flammer. She's an economist at Columbia University. Uh, this paper by Flammer, the reasoning is the following. If a firm invests a lot in green activity, this is increases the value of the firm it increases the value of the firm across all assets. So when I'm comparing, I'm gonna compare the price of all different assets issued by this firm. I'm not gonna observe a greenium because there are spillovers. So if you could also think about this from a country. So if, a, if a country issues a lot of credible sovereign bonds and all this green investment makes the country more resilient to climate risk, well, this will reduce you know, the spread paid by this country on, on all of his assets, assets, and so I will not observe a greenium for this country. But but that's a very good question. There's a question. <clears throat> Let's wait for the mic. Because... 
Thank you for your talk, Professor. And I wanted to follow up on Dr. Plummer's um, comment. Given the nature of the immediacy of this crisis, as you talked about the eight years that we have to reach 1.5, does it make sense to, and excuse me if I'm missing something on this, because I'm not totally an economist as of yet, um, if we wait around for countries to do debt restructuring, don't you think that basically is we're not preemptively dealing with this crisis? Um, shouldn't there be an option for basically countries if we're going to go down that path of, of including a climate conditionality? Shouldn't they be able to apply to that mechanism? Couldn't it be a little bit more, yeah, open for demand? Uh, maybe that's actually a very good question. Um, maybe there are um, conditions in which this preemptive thing uh, would be a good idea, but we're not going to see it. One, one thing, so, 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 so let me tell you an anecdote, which I love to tell. Um, in 2006, I, I, I wrote in a, I was working at the Inter-American Development Bank in Washington, and I wrote in a report that, you know, we always tend to think about countries not willing to repay their debt. But actually, when you look at the situation, it's, often the opposite. Countries uh, tend to postpone needed debt restructuring too much. Like us going to the dentist, you know, you just always go to the last moment. So after writing this, <clears throat> I was called um, uh, to the office of the vice president of the IDB, Brazilian guy. <laughs> and, uh, and basically the guy told me that I, he was going to fire me. That this was irresponsible. This would greatly damage the credit worthiness of Latin American debt and, and that and that. So it, it was very tough. I kind of didn't care because I already accepted a job in, uh, in Geneva. So I knew that I was leaving after six months <laughs> and kind of said, I'm going to live with a bank. <laughs> but then I, 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 I went and, and, and talked with my boss, uh, Guillermo Calvo. And Guillermo got very upset because he said, you know, if I approve this with this guy. And, and so there, there was this kind of escalated, went to the board of the bank and so on and so forth. And, you know, and then at the end, nothing, nothing happened. So, so this, this is to tell you that saying that a country wait too long to restructure was incredibly controversial 16 years ago. In 2013, the IMF, <coughs> came out with a report. This is not a signed report. So this was not a report signed by X person. This was, a, this was an IMF policy report. So this is the policy of the IMF, which in the first page, it says, it is now well known and well establishes that countries default too late and too little. So in seven years, this went from, you know, fireable statement to, to, be, to, to be, uh, you know, official policy uh, uh, of the fund. But this is, uh, so I told you this anecdote to tell you that, uh, yes, there, there are conditions. And that's not always the case, right? You, you need, to, so the, defaulting is, a, is an incredibly consequential decision, which has already structured the debt, which, you know, uh, has all sorts of effects. So it's not uh, a decision that should be taken lightly. Uh, but uh, we are very unlikely to see countries doing it prevent pre preemptively. Maybe this is more a curiosity about the financial situation that may upset the problems of the climate change. And I was wondering, um, according to your experience, um, about the effectiveness of uh, uh, green bonds mm, uh, compared with the sustainability linked bonds and the other instrument that you mentioned in the end, the debt for nature swaps. Uh, especially what um, uh, I also would like as a curiosity to know, according to your experience, the, the typical clause that you highlighted of no legal obligation to ensure that particular A, did, did you see the same types of um, legal um, 
uh, legal clause also in the sustainability link bonds or in the other. So, uh, because if that is a legal clause that is typically in the contracts for green bonds, then uh, I wonder about the effectiveness uh, of these different types of financial tools. Okay, so first of all, in the sustainability link bonds, um, we don't know much because uh, to the best of our knowledge, there is only one that exists, which has been issued by Chile. So, so we don't know uh, much about what is going there. But from a legal point of view, uh, the issue there, it's a bit easier because in the, in the typical green bonds, I have a specific allocation of expenditure. So I say, I have to spend this money to do this, to do that, to do that. So, uh, and, and, and in a sense, this removes authority from you know, the political process. While in a sustainability linked bond, uh, there is no commitment to uh, take a specific action. There is really a commitment to achieve an objective, which is what you care about, right? So what you care about, so if the objective is mitigation, the only thing that you care about is that X country puts less CO2 in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And then are you gonna put less, you know, you have a, you know, a crazy French degrowth person that says, you know, I'm gonna put less CO2 by degrowing. Fine, you respected your commitment. I'm gonna put less CO2 in the atmosphere by, you know, making policy that favors, you know, green vehicle, you know, EVs. Fine, I'm gonna put less CO2 in the atmosphere by, you know, subsidizing solar panel. Fine, I'm gonna do something else, fine. My only objective is that when the CO2 that I emit is measured, that it's lower than that's it. Okay, so, 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 that, so that again is a way in which you can structure it. So one way to do it, you could think that if you don't reach the objective, your coupon goes up and that's a bit complicated, but you could also think of a structure in which if you don't reach the objective, your coupon goes down. And, and then, so, I mean, there again, the, the, the way you, you, you structure this, right? Any more question? Any more last? Yes, please. Yes, I have a quick comment on the previous question on the green bonds and who buys them and, and the question or a, a bit of crystal ball glazing that I'm asking Hugo and we'll see. Uh, seems like a good time almost at the end of the, of the presentation. The quick comment is that uh, basically many of the companies that you mentioned uh, do this and it's a big marketing ploy, right? It's a big marketing tool uh, because the popularity of environmental issues at some point, uh, uh, these asset managers or investment managers have realized that there will be appetite among investors for things that have an environmental look on it, and so uh, we already alluded to greenwashing means we paint the, the bonds green and uh, put them in a in a fund, and people may be more willing to to buy them than than others, but not necessarily at a lower uh, at a lower coupon. But at least you may reach in this way certain investors that you know may not buy our bonds otherwise. Uh, there have already been case of uh, the Deutsche Bank Asset Management Company being accused of uh, doing the wrong things about this because the bonds were actually not so green after all. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the crystal ball glazing, I would like to concentrate on the one of the three points of your triangle, that's the political uh, feasibility would seem to be the trickiest one because of course we know how to make these things scalable and possibly know how to make them fair but the political feasibility may be the most the most difficult thing and this thing seems to go in waves I don't know if it's connected with the COP meetings when everybody hopes are raised and then there's backlash and all that uh, so I was wondering what what's your feeling or what's your uh, idea are we going the right direction there or not considering that i mean there's a very large swathe of negationists in the us uh, well bolsonaro may have been defeated in brazil that may help uh, but in europe 
you know, we of course are suffering from the consequence of the Ukraine Russia war, which means, you know, any environmental task is possibly made more difficult or maybe easier. I don't know. Uh, so I was wondering how, in this bit of a confused question, how you see the the direction or the the, the political feasibility of this issue is, is taking at the moment. Uh, I'm pessimistic, so I don't know if that, <laughs> if that, um, because, um, again, so I, I, I don't think that this should be left or to, you know, voluntary act. So maybe, you know, individually each of us could do something, but I think this should really come uh, as mandatory decision taken uh, by political leaders, and I don't see I don't see any political leader uh, willing to uh, pay the potential political price, which is linked to decision which might be unpopular in the in the short run. I, I was thinking, I, I, in fact, I tweeted this the other day. I, I, I was think about think about a parallel world in which. Uh, in which President Clinton resigned after the Lewis get fight fair, and Al Gore gets elected, and then he gets reelected, and he seemed to be a politician who really cared about climate change. Maybe we would be in a different world, but that's a counterfactual exercise. <laughs> okay, I think on this somber note, we can <laughs> probably <laughs> go for someone just to to lighten the spirit a little bit. So, Hugo, let me thank you very much for this therapy speaking and for having accepted to visit us in Bologna, and we really hope to have you here very soon. Thank, thank you. you. Grazie.